All right, so let's say you want to build the largest telescope in the world, specifically the largest radio telescope in the world. What do you need? Well, take some perforated aluminum panels, about six foot high and four feet wide, take 39,000 of them, and put them together in a perfect bowl where the alignment and shape of that bowl is precise to within one millimeter. You'll need a mountaintop somewhere that's kind of got a natural sort of bowl shape structure to it, not, um, if, uh, if you're lucky at least, a volcano, but some kind of natural landscape in which to build this bowl. Then you need about 900 tons of structural steel and some cables and some pillars to suspend this steel about 500 feet up in the air over this dish that you've built. And this dish is 305 meters across, so bigger than three football fields laid end to end, this way and this way. And uh, you'll need a dome suspended from that big uh, steel structure that's itself about 100 tons of aluminum and flooring and stairs and electronics, detectors and cables and transmitters, etc. And then you can have what was until very recently when the Chinese upped the ante a little bit, the largest telescope on planet Earth, and that is the Arecibo Radio Telescope at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. So we're going to visit there with you today, take you there to the dish, and talk about the Arecibo Observatory, this amazing construction that was built in the 1960s, and uh, that's when construction started. We're going to take you to an insider's tour of this amazing facility, and we're going to talk to uh, SETI Institute scientist Michael Bush uh, about that and about the science and research that's done there. So maybe Lee, you can take a little close-up look here. This is the Arecibo Observatory. If any of you saw the movie Contact, or I think it was Goldeneye was the James Bond film that featured this, it'll look familiar to you. It's, it's a pretty iconic piece of equipment. It's, um, it's quite famous. I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with it at least. So this gantry here, we were out at the very tip of that gantry. You'll see some photos and video footage of us standing on the edge of that gantry. And also on top of this superstructure that is suspended by these cables from the three towers. And this structure sits at about 500 feet above the bottom of the dish. And we'll take you inside what's called the Gregorian Dome, where there's two other reflectors that ultimately direct the reflected radio uh, signals coming off of the main dish or the primary dish up into an array of detectors that cover the radio spectrum from about one to 10 gigahertz. So we're gonna go inside the dome and we're even gonna take you underneath. So we'll leave that down there at the, at the hole in the dish. So let's go take a close look at the Arecibo Observatory. I'm Bill Diamond, the President and CEO of the SETI Institute here in Mountain View, California. And you're joining our Facebook Live weekly talks where we bring you some inside uh, scoops on our science and research and, and meet the folks behind the scenes and make it all possible. Come on in, let's say hi to Michael. Michael, how are you doing? Okay. What a coincidence to find you here. <laughs> Please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Into your seat. Yeah, very good. Very good. All right. So uh, as promised, we're gonna we're gonna go behind the scenes at the Arecibo Observatory and Michael will explain a little bit later why he's got what appear to be some some rocks sitting in front of him, actually 3D printed um, asteroid model, so we'll talk about those in a little bit. But there's that uh, iconic view overhead of the Arecibo Observatory. And if this works right, so now you can see, so we're going to back up again. Do I have mouse? Does people see the mouse if I put it over the picture? Yeah, okay, this, you can see a catwalk coming from this side, pillar, all the way out, suspended over the, the, the uh, primary reflector. We walked across that to get out to the superstructure. Very hard to see. Very hard to see them out. Well, okay. I don't, catwalk. Catwalk, yeah. Maybe you can see it on the upper right-hand part of the screen. In any case, we'll, we'll take a closer look at that. So there is a picture, a photograph. Uh, this is me taking the picture. So we're kind of suspended above the, the primary dish. If I looked straight down at that metal grid floor, you can see right through it. And about 500 feet below is the, is the dish. And you can see on the lower right-hand uh, middle of the photograph that the white dome, that's the Gregorian dome where the reflectors and detectors are. It's, it's massive. It's probably not too much smaller than the dome in the U.S. Capitol building. It's deceivingly It's about large. 60 meters across that dome. 60 meters across, yeah. Which 
Perfect. Whatever, 190 feet. 190. So it, it's huge. And, you know, I, I have to tell you, having been there, Michael's been there many times, when you're on the ground, even though you're there, right, right in front of the, uh, of the observatory, and you're looking up at the superstructure, and you're looking up at the dome, it's impossible to get a sense of exactly how big that structure is and how big the dome is. It's, it's really difficult to appreciate. But there we are. And uh, here, here we are again walking out. I think we've got a little video clip here so we can play that and get a sense. So you can hear the metal noise under our feet and then looking down below. So it's not for the uh, people with, with uh, what is it, vertigo and agro <laughs> aquaphobia. So uh, it's, it's a long way up and, and I'm kind of walking along there holding the camera in two hands, which probably isn't the smartest thing to do, but but it was, uh, gave some, some thrilling perspectives from up there. Now, one of the things I think we're going to be talking about is the damages the observatory had yes. during Hurricane Maria. That's right. One of the first things they had to fix after the hurricane was the floor on the catwalk. Because some, some of those things A, just a large fell section of it detached through. and fell down 500 feet out of the dish. And, and went smashing through panels, destroyed panels, right? So initially people had to go back out there going on the roof of the catwalk, <laughs> which is something I really have no need to do. No, no. But that's they, how they got out there. Lots of appropriate safety straps and so on, yeah. so that they didn't fall. Yeah. Yeah, that what's overhead is a conduit that carries all the cables that bring power to the Gregorian Dome and to the observatory itself because there's mechanical motors there that move things around and also they take the signals coming from the detectors back to the control room. So that's a big massive cable conduit that goes overhead and as Michael's pointing out, people had to walk on that to do some of the repairs to the catwalk after Hurricane Maria. You may remember that was the hurricane a year and a half ago now that just devastated, about a year and a half. Uh, really devastated the, the island of Puerto Rico. And I will say that the observatory team there became part of the uh, kind of rescue and recovery effort. They have a helipad there at the observatory and FEMA delivered supplies to the observatory thinking that the observatory folks needed supplies and they said, you know, we're fine, we're covered, but um, uh, we can take these supplies, we've got pickup trucks and other gear and we can uh, help you distribute them on the island. So they took loads of uh, equipment and supplies, food, water, etc., cetera, um, that were delivered by FEMA helicopters and they helped distribute those to uh, the people in the island. So uh, it was really quite a remarkable um, situation. I, mean, I, I understood in my conversations with the team down there, there, was, there were a dozen staff and scientists on site at the time during the hurricane, it must have been pretty amazing. It was actually safer for some of them to stay there than to stay at their houses because the observatory right. structure, you can see it's 1950s heavy metal. The observing building is basically a concrete bunker. Yeah, that's so true. They were able to shelter in there during the hurricane. They also have their own generators and well and so on. So they had power and water, which were extremely important for people in the village of Esperanza a couple of miles down the road right. after the hurricane. Yeah, and they uh, uh, were, were there through it. Um, and according to the folks who were there, they said that the loudest noise, the most incredible noise they heard besides the rushing wind itself was the sound of snapping trees. So trees were just breaking like twigs in the wind. There's a, a kind of a, well, I wouldn't call it a laboratory, a shop on, on the grounds there. It has a you know, heavy duty metal corrugated roof and a tree came crashing right through that roof uh, during the hurricane. So pretty, pretty dramatic. In any case, uh, that's the, uh, the catwalk there. And here we are at the top. Now you get a better view of the catwalk on the left side of the picture. So you can see it's suspended by the cable structure that overhangs the dish. And uh, now we're up above. So we're uh, almost the very top of, of the um, superstructure or the gantry that is suspended above the dish. We are above the Gregorian dome that hangs down below the armature that, um, uh, that suspends the dome and allows that dome to move on a track. We'll show you that track, and also that, that whole track can rotate 360 degrees. So that really gives the telescope the ability to look at different parts of the sky. Anything that's within about 20 degrees of straight up, you can only go so far off to one side on the azimuth arm before you run out of arm. Yeah. So this is different than you know the telescopes we're used to, where the whole telescope moves, or the primary mirror moves. Here, the primary reflector uh, is stationary, and you're moving the secondary reflectors and the, the detectors essentially to right. observe different parts of the sky. Um, this is a, an overhead view. Now we're above the central rotary arm. So there's a motor there which turns this big ring you can see in the middle of the, of the photograph. So the again, the, the armature from which the Gregorian dome is suspended 
hangs below that ring, so the ring can rotate the armature, and then the dome can move along that armature to the different parts of the sky. And it's also, I think, probably a, the, the, the single place in, in all of Puerto Rico where you, where you get the best aerial views of the island, short of being up on a plane, right? <laughs> it's pretty So you're pretty at this view. point about, what, 150 meters, 400 some feet above the surrounding average ground level. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit awkward because Puerto Rico's central part of the island is what we call limestone karst. Yes, right. They've got uh, limestone blocks that go up and down every thousand feet, which is convenient if you wish to build a thousand foot wide telescope and yeah. hole in the ground. It made this this kind of natural dish that they were able to take advantage. You can see the background goes up and down a lot. Yeah, so it, the observatory, I believe, is not all that high up. It's not like an uh, an optical observatory where you really want to get as high as you can. I think the observatory is a little over a thousand feet, twelve hundred feet, if I'm not mistaken, something along those Depending lines. Depending on where on that platform you are standing. Well, the platform, then you're even higher up, of course. But yes, and uh, I think the biggest mountains I was told on Puerto Rico are you know four or five thousand feet. So those are over in El Yunque, which is on the opposite east side. end of the island. So Arecibo is over on the west side. And it's just below the, the north coast. So there's a town of Arecibo along the coast, about an hour's w drive west from San Juan, and then just go up the mountain a little bit uh, to the south of Arecibo, uh, the town, and then you get to the observatory. Uh, so this is another, another video. So you'll get a chance to see what it's like from up top. So write to us and let us know if you're getting dizzy. And that's, that, that's the... Uh, the armature below, and that's Luis in the white helmet. He's uh, uh, engineering staff at the observatory, and the young gentleman with the yellow helmet on is actually a graduate student at, I believe, Penn State, and he's working on rebuilding the 430 megahertz uh, feet, which broke off during the storm. I think we have a picture of that you can maybe explain a little so, bit. So, Arecibo initially did not have that Gregorian dome. Right. That was added in the It was 90s. added in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. because you have to build, you'll see later, three separate mirrors in order to do that Gregorian telescope optics. Initially, it just had the spherical primary reflector. Those of you who study optics may recall, you need a parabola in order to get everything light coming in focused down to a point. With a sphere, you get a line instead of a point. So you need a really long feed that covers a big section of space in order to catch all of the signal that you care about. Because you're getting that linear signal. So of they points. initially built, in the 1950s, a series of long line antennas that would hang down from the azimuth arm. Some on one side, some on the other side, so things are balanced in weight. Most of those were taken out in the 1990s upgrade. Mm -hmm. And with the Gregorian bringing everything out to a point, things are much more compact and more sensitive. But they still kept the line feed on one side for the long wavelength low frequency observations where you couldn't fit the antenna terribly well inside the Gregorian. That 430 megahertz 70 centimeter feed snapped off near the base during Hurricane Maria and basically came down like a dart. <laughs> and it through. punched a large hole in the dish. Yes, yeah. That hole has now been patched, but they need to build a whole new line feed. And that's what this fellow is helping to design. And then they have to bring it up in pieces yeah. by driving it underneath the dish, you'll see that later, and then there's a hole, you can make a hole in the center of the dish and lift stuff up to the platform that way. So For stuff that's too big to bring up on the catwalk. And that feed, um, when it was intact, was uh, like 110 feet long. So imagine it's a 10-story building, if you will, very skinny, hanging upside down from the top superstructure. And uh, one of the things they did uh, in preparation for the hurricane was the, the very bottom part of that feed. They actually removed. They thought, this is the most vulnerable part. Let's take that off. That involved somebody up there with harnesses and safety equipment literally suspended. I think pretty much like the James Bond movie, suspended from the, the feed that itself. That is the least unrealistic part of that movie. It, it is, exactly, yeah. And uh, taking off the, 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 the tip end and, and then bringing it down. But uh, as Michael points out, that feed broke into several parts in the hurricane. So there's, I th think, the, the part that's left on it, we have a shot of it, you'll see it's only about 20 feet long, but, uh, but pretty amazing. And uh, so here's some, some different shots. So here again yeah, on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side. Yeah, there's, there's the, the feed. Light feed. Gantry, or the uh, walkway um, on the left, and this is the azimuth arm. So we're standing now 
on the azimuth arm, you can see Luis pointing down, and behind him is, is a ramp that continues up the arm. So uh, that's the, the um, armature from which the Gregorian dome and the line feed hang. And on the right-hand side, you can see what is left. So what that piece at the bottom that has, looks like a spiral piece of pasta hanging down is, I think, what is it, about a couple of feet in diameter? It's a, so it's designed to catch 70, 70 centimeters. centimeters. So. What radio waves? Yeah. So that's roughly the size of the width of the feet. About like so. Basically, you've got a whole series of antennas stacked one on top of the other, and put the line of those all the way down, and you catch the entire signal. And that's uh, that's the part so when it doesn't snap off. And when it doesn't snap off, drop into the dish. So uh, what's what's left there is about 20 feet or two stories worth of what had been 110 foot uh, feet, and that's what they need to be to replace. Uh, and here we have a photograph taken above the uh, armature and above the Gregorian dome. So now you can see the big white golf ball-like top of the Gregorian dome. And um, uh, you can see now the dish below it. If you look carefully, you can actually make out kind of individual panels, the thousands of individual panels that make up the dome. And uh, by the way, uh, sorry, that make up the, uh, the primary mirror and dish, those are, are suspended. They're not kind of sitting on the ground. They're suspended by the cable network. Ma Michael mentioned before going underneath the dish We'll take you underneath the dish shortly. Uh, so the azimuth arm that they were standing on, the last of the pictures is this track here in the middle, runs up and down in the center. Picture. I don't know if you can see this mouse, but that that there is the is the track that we were standing on, and we, we walked up to the end of that. So take another video tour. You can just see around the the view and perspective. We'll look down at the dish here. So, and there's the. Uh, the young graduate student who's designing the, the new line feed. Can you kind of hear the wind blowing and howling and the top there? This is the helipad, you can see. That's the, the line feed. Now you're looking down at the dish and all the individual panels. Again, if you're afraid of heights, you do not want to be up there. And here we are walking inside the dome. So now we're, we're inside the Gregorian dome and uh, there's uh, Louise and the graduate student. You're seeing through the hole in the dome down to the primary mirror or the main dish. So that's where the signal is reflected off of that dish onto a secondary mirror that is above their heads and above my head from this vantage point. See the edge, see of, it. The right edge of it here. at the very top of the picture. And then that, uh, the uh, beams are then reflected from that secondary mirror to a third or tertiary mirror, which is below us which then directs the signal ultimately straight upward into the bottom of a network of different so-called feeds or uh, detectors that operate at different uh, radio frequencies, different wavelengths. And they're on a great big turret, about 10 feet in diameter, that rotates a little bit like a microscope turret there where you can put different objective lenses in your optical path. Uh, same idea, you've got a great big turret that has the large electronic detectors on it and you rotate the one you want that's looking at the part of the spectrum you're interested in into the right position and that third mirror will direct and focus the radio uh, signals up into the detector. Now that can only move back and forth so fast. You don't want to shock the detectors too much by slamming them back right, and forth. Right. So there's a limit as to how fast you can switch from one frequency to another frequency at the telescope. And you'll uh, be so glad to know Don't do well. switching every five seconds though. Strain things too much. That's right. And you can see in the lower right a doorway. So there, there's a room uh, inside there, and that's where the detector array is, and the big turntable is. And when you go in that room, there's a nice red button that you can push, which means that they will not turn the turntable there while you're on it doing something, um, and if, <laughs> maybe have something nasty happen to you. But while we were there, we did call down and ask them to turn it for us, just so we could see it move, and that was that was kind of fun. We're going to have some more video clips that we can share with you today up on our website. We've got to put some of those together, piece together some, uh, some footage. So we'll be doing that in the coming days, and we'll let you know on our website when we've got some things to look at. We'll, we'll post it on Facebook and uh, our Twitter accounts and show you. But there's lots more uh, f uh, video footage and uh, still photography that uh, will show you this extraordinary site. And uh, here we are outside. That's a better view of the feed again. And the dome down inside. All right, and 
Then we go to these uh, still photographs. So here, in the left-hand picture, you can see that circular um, portion, a circular portion of the secondary reflector, uh, sorry, the tertiary reflector. So that's down below us. That reflects the beams um, up into the detectors. And in the middle photograph, you see a shiny dome, which is above our heads. And that is the secondary reflector. So that's where the, the signals are bounced off the primary mirror, up to that secondary, down to the tertiary, and up into the bottom of the detectors. In the third picture on the right, we're inside the uh, Gregorian dome. You can just make out at, uh, at about knee height for Luis, you can make out the red boundary. That's the edge of the turntable. They're looking at one of the detectors. This is the L-band detector, Michael, yes, there in front of Yes, this is called Alpha. It was provided by the CSIRO astronomy team in Australia, hence the edge of the logo down at the bottom there. Has the map of Australia. And on top of it, uh, just in case you're thinking that astronomers don't sort of have a sense of sentimentality or, or humor, there's a, you know, a little stuffed kangaroo sitting on top of the detector. <laughs> a little out of sight, but we'll, we'll show you a picture of that on the website later. But uh, that's what it looks like inside that room. And here we are now, we've gone outside the room, we've gone down yet another flight of stairs. We're still inside the Gregorian Dome. And here you are looking up at the bottom of the turntable, and you'll see different funny looking circular objects hanging down. Michael, maybe you can talk about some of them uh, here if you're familiar. So the largest one over on this side, that's the, the right alpha receiver side. that you saw before. That's doing 20 centimeter radio waves. This is convenient for astronomy because hydrogen gas, which is of course really abundant in the universe, has a very nice emission line and radio frequencies at 21 centimeters, mm -hmm. 14, 20 megahertz. So if you want to study hydrogen, you need lots and lots of radio receivers that are about that big. And the alpha receiver over there has a grid of many of them put together, so you can look at more sky at once. And that means it's physically a pretty large object. The smaller feeds here are at higher frequencies, anything from 2 up to about 10, about 10. megahertz. Yeah. Yeah. They can do lower frequency observations, but that typically uses the line feed and the even larger antennas that they can mount physically out on the dish. We're hoping, and we talked about this actually when I was down at Arecibo, uh, as you all know, we have our own Allen Telescope Array. In fact, the model of that is above Michael's head. You can uh, zoom, zoom over there, Lee, for a second. Um, and we have also what we call feeds or antennas uh, on our radio telescope. And we have a single feed that operates from about 1 gigahertz up to 15 gigahertz in one device. And yeah, they, there's the... This is the one-to-one -one model here. Yeah, that's the exactly earlier version like. of the feed to scale. That one um, actually went from about 500 megahertz to uh, 10 gigahertz. We now go from about a gigahertz to um, 15 gigahertz and what we're calling the second generation feed uh, that was uh, the development for which was funded by uh, Franklin Antonio from uh, Qualcomm and we hence call them the Antonio feeds. And we're talking to the Arecibo folks about hanging one of the Antonio feeds uh, inside the Gregorian dome uh, to do some of our own radio astronomy and maybe some SETI work. So that's the an tricky part is that there's only so much space on this turret. Yeah, something else. So has we to have do. to take one re receiver out and put a new re you want to put a new receiver in. That's right. Uh, there are uh, this dish is actually really uh, this whole antenna system is really optimized up to about five gigahertz. It goes up to ten gigahertz. Uh, some other retrofits would have to be made, really, including the surface of the of the dish itself, if you wanted to go to the, some of the higher frequencies. But uh, we think we can do some interesting science. There are some detectors there that aren't used very often on the turntable, so the plan would be to take off some of those lesser used feeds, put on the Allen Telescope Antonio feed, and do some interesting stuff. Um, and there's a new feed that is being developed um, at, is it Brigham Young, I think, or one of, I'm not sure which university, uh, but it's a feed called the Alpaca feed, and it's going to be an array of small little dipole feeds. You can see them at the bottom middle of that of that picture. Um, a very small, white-looking um, uh, structure hanging down. And uh, I'll put the cursor there in case you can see that uh, on the screen. But um, so that's a, a new feed that'll be that's being developed and built, and will be ready for installation in a couple of years. With any luck, that's a lot of work to put something like that together. That's just a feed. Uh, and here we are uh, again on, on the gantry. So this is the azimuth arm that is above the dome. 
and we're going to walk out to the end of that azimuthal. And if the telescope was actually working, tracking some, you know, the sky, the Gregorian dome and the line people was working, the line people would be moving back and forth along the track underneath them. Yes, that's they right. They do not let people up there when things are moving around <laughs> for obvious reasons. So here we are going up literally to the very end of that arm. Told me to watch my head. Good advice. Michael was, was saying that, you know, the reason you, you wear helmets up there is not like you're expecting something to fall on your head, but rather you're so distracted by all the amazing things you're seeing that it's very easy to walk around and bump your head on something else. So, uh, so that's the safety precaution. There's the walkway that you can see there leading up to the top. And there's the central turntable and turret, and there's the gantry that we walked up. So it's a kind of a curved path. And then looking down below at the dome and the dish 500 feet below. So it's like hanging over the edge of the Prudential Building in Boston or the uh, Transamerica Tower in San Francisco. Um, you're, you're way up. And there again is the, is the walkway. Um, and this one is uh, just before we descended back down uh, the, the gantry to the control room area. So I'll show you that. And one last look around from the top of the Arecibo Observatory. So we want some thumbs up and some hearts for the Arecibo Observatory, for my acrobatic stunts, doing video filming while walking around up there and trying not to fall off. And um, also, we'll, we'll be taking some questions from you. So if you have some questions about the observatory or the visit there or the science that's done there, please let us know. And as always, we'd love to find out where you're, where you're joining us from. And we've already got a bit of a list here. So uh, let's go ahead now and uh, go down to ground level. So here we are at ground level. And if you, if you did see the movie Contact, you may remember one of the iconic scenes early in that film. Jodie Foster is walking around the perimeter at the base of the observatory. That movie came out now, what, 21 years ago, I think. So it was filmed a couple of years before yeah. it was originally released. And that was during that Arecibo upgrade we mentioned in the mid-1990s. It also coincided with when they filmed the James Bond movie. You were there. probably, what, 10 years old or something at that point? Less. <laughs> Less. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> but. They were working using the telescope for science at that time, so it was easier to get the film crews in. Ah, okay, I didn't realize that. And uh, anyway, that's a great scene, and I remember watching that movie the first time, uh, and uh, quite a bit older than Michael, I'm sad to say, but nevertheless, being enthralled and saying, oh, I someday I need to go visit that, that telescope. It was pretty impressive. So we're, you're, I'm actually peeking through underneath the outer perimeter um, screen that is at the edge of the dish, and uh, on, on the upper left part, and looking at the panels and looking, you can see there now the curved profile of that primary mirror. And here we are um, underneath the dish now. So here I'm in a, one of the Arecibo site vehicles, a pickup truck, and I'm with uh, Francisco Cordova. He's the director of the Arecibo Observatory. He's driving. I'm just hanging out the window <laughs> uh, taking some pictures, but uh, we'll, we'll drive down. So. Uh, what you see above you in the top of that is the bottom, this is the underside of the dish. And you'll see what you know, looks like a pretty well-designed and perfect curvature. But again, they have to maintain the curvature of that dish to one millimeter precision. And Michael, we were talking earlier about how they adjust that. Maybe you can tell people so, a little bit about the adjustments. I was down at the observatory this past December to, among other things, understand the ongoing process of repairing damage to the observatory after the hurricane. I mentioned they had, had panels get knocked out off the dish by the secondary effect from the line feet hitting the dish or this hurricane ripping things off. Those have been replaced, but the dish is really quite distorted. It's not going to be visible in this picture because we're looking at a dish 300 meters wide. Our eyes are not going to see a millimeter. <laughs> True. But if you're trying to deal with radio waves that are a couple centimeters long, the higher frequency end, what they're doing down there, and you care about the position of all the panels on that dish to a couple of millimeters. 39,000 panels, remember. So they have now done a laser scan. They mount a laser LIDAR ranging system up on top of the platform, and they scan the entire dish. And everything is kind of distorted by a couple of millimeters. That doesn't matter so much for the lower frequency observations. 
because longer wavelengths. If I've got 20 centimeter long wave, I can move things around by a millimeter or two, it doesn't matter. But at the higher frequencies, the sensitivity of the dish is down by about a factor of two. So they really haven't been doing much to the upper frequency, 10 gigahertz end. In order to be able to do that again, they need to go through and first work out all the corrections they need to make all the panels, and then have the work crew go underneath. And you see, maybe you even can't see, depending on how good the translation is here, but there's on every single panel wires from every corner. And they go down to these concrete pillars on the ground. And the way you adjust the panels is you physically go in there and you turn screws at the base of each of those cables by the appropriate number of half turns. And that adjusts just things by the appropriate number of millimeters. And then they have to do that almost 40,000 times. Yeah. It's so a this takes a month a process. They think, they think they can speed it up to maybe take three months. Yeah. By the fact that they have the laser scanner. Which That's true. Speeds yes. up the process. process of measuring everything. Yeah. Previously, they had to stand up at the top and range find each separate panel individually rather than doing them all on a single pass. Yeah. But of course, they want to adjust all the panels and then scan the dish again. And any parts that aren't quite right, they have to go back and fix. There so is it talk takes a about while. Uh, you know putting some motor drives on the cable system to more automate that process. But you know, a that's expensive and time consuming, and you know it's a, a lot of sophisticated electronics to have feedback mechanisms which would understand the relative position of those cables and, and, and the dishes. That and actually gets into one of the questions that was asked here. Uh -huh. Differences see. between Arecibo Observatory and the FAST telescope in China, besides the sides. So FAST, 500 meter aperture. But it's so it looks like this. It looks it, very similar. It's a little bigger. But 500 meters instead of 300 meters. Five football fields across. It's Jisu uh, province, I want to say. They found a similar limestone karst landscape, which there's quite a lot of in China, southern sure. China. And they found a hole that was about 500 meters wide with a telescope in it. But they actually only use about what Arecibo is same, worth same size, of that right. mirror right. at a given time. They just can go further away from the vertical. But one of the things they've been trying to implement there is automatically adjusting the positions of all the panels. Because the more you go off to one side, the more it matters the exact deviation in the shape of the mirror. That really hasn't gotten working particularly well yet. Because you got to coordinate in their case, even more than 40,000 panels. Yeah, I don't know how many do they have. Huh? And all the actuators, or not, almost all of them have to be working, and they have to constantly adjust things. Arecibo doesn't need to constantly adjust, because they're Once not set it. so far off vertical. Mm -hmm. And things are getting tugged sideways as much. But going back and adjusting all of these into some automated system would be a really extensive process. Right now, they're focused more on fixing the damage to the observatory. Yeah, and I think yeah, other fixes and upgrades probably are a higher priority. But let's take you for a drive under the dish. Uh, the, the following day, I walked underneath the dish and went from the outer edge down to you know ground zero, if you will, right underneath the hole in the middle. And uh, it's, it's a good 20 to 30 minute, uh, minute walk because you're kind of spiraling down to the bottom. But uh, here we are in the pickup truck driving underneath the dish. Straightforward. So you'll see a creek here that actually runs underneath the dish in the middle there. So normally, limestone cars is pretty porous. So you get a certain amount of water coming in underneath every time it rains. A lot of that will drain out and then through the creek and then it goes underground and then you can pump out the rest. During the hurricane, that really wasn't an option. And everything you're seeing here was underwater. It took several months for the water level to come back down. It did, yeah, it did. Three months, I was told by Francisco, to, to really drain it. Up until the pumps that they normally use to remove the water were not underwater themselves. Yeah. So one of the things that they're doing repairs, they're gonna replace those pumps with some stuff that's a bit further up the sides so that it's less likely to get flooded should there be another really big hurricane. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you can see in this video that network of, of concrete pillars that the cables are tied to. And, uh, but you know, if you got the feeling that this looks a little bit like you're inside one of the cages in Jurassic Park, then you're not far wrong. <laughs> it really feels like that underneath the dish. I'm gonna take you back in the video a little bit because I wanna point out that looking up uh, from the bottom underneath, 
you can see the dome because in fact the panels are not solid panels they're perforated with little holes and uh, you can you can see kind of right through them when you're looking underneath at the brighter sky so you'll notice as the video progresses here pointing the camera up and there is the Gregorian dome there's the superstructure that we were walking on earlier in the day and then here we are back underneath so each of the holes in, that, in the mesh of those panels is a couple of millimeters wide and that sets the upper limit of the frequencies the Arecibo can work with. If you get up to about 10 gigahertz, your radio waves are three centimeters long. At that point, it starts to matter that your panels have a little holes in them. Holes in them every couple of millimeters. Right. And the dish starts to become transparent rather than the radio waves hitting and bouncing back off. They start to go through. Yep. And then you're losing most of your signal to the ground. And that's one reason why they don't go to higher frequencies. That and the difficulties of keeping a surface that big smooth to better than a millimeter. So that's, that's one of the problems or one of the expenses and one of the things that they would have to uh, spend money on to retrofit the observatory for higher frequencies would be really to change out all the panels. So as you can imagine, that's a big job. And here I am uh, standing underneath and it's bright white uh, light to the left, uh, uh, to my right shoulder, to the left of the picture, and that is the absolute middle of the dish, and it's open. Um, and of course, it, you really don't need panels there because they're in that part of the dish is in the shadow of the uh, dome and superstructure overhead. So it's 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 empty. There are some high frequency antennas. One of them is behind me. It looks like a big uh, utility pole uh, uh, just to the uh, off my right shoulder and that is holding a high frequency antenna. There's what, four or five of them uh, underneath four, well, I think. Yeah, high astronomers, radio astronomers, and radio operators in general have a bit of an annoying nomenclature. We have high frequency, very high frequency, ultra high frequency. Ultra high frequency, right. So the high frequency stuff he's talking about is, what is it, 75 megahertz? Yes, yeah. Which is only high frequency relative to things like FM and AM radio. Right. Actually, it overlaps with some of the FM radio bands, which is a problem when you're doing radio astronomy because people like listening to the radio. Get interference. But those antennas are physically quite large. You couldn't fit them inside the dome. So they mount them down at the bottom, which is not as sensitive, but they can still do some get science. Out. And those, so if you looked at photographs of the dome and you'll, I mean, of the dish from above, and again, you'll see some more of them on our website, you'll see these sort of cross patterns. Those are the dipole antennas that are at the top of these towers. Those towers are probably 60 feet in height uh, when you're standing underneath them. But from way above, they, they, they look tiny. And the other thing that this large opening is useful for is hauling big things up to the sure. platform. Yeah. So we talked earlier about replacing the line feed. They'll bring it down here in pieces and then lift those up and secure them in place. It is a big production, but that's the only way to get really big things up to the platform safely. All right, so that's the, the kind of the tour of the facility itself. Next, we're going to talk a bit, little bit about the science that is done there. Um, I'm going to pause to address some of the questions that have come up before we dive into that. Um, and we'll do a shout out to uh, uh, our global audience again, who are joining us from all over the place, Rosario in Argentina, Louisiana, Istanbul, Portugal, Burbank, California, beautiful downtown. Burbank, as Johnny Carson used to say, nobody younger than 100 will know what that means. London, England, uh, and Northwest, uh, Northeast UK, it says here. Ohio, Dallas, Trinidad and Tobago, um, Grand Prairie, Alberta, Canada. Very cool. Wisconsin, Des Moines, Iowa, Vero Beach, Florida, Wales, Houston, Texas, Arkansas, Charleston, South Carolina, Ireland, Dortmund in Germany, Mexico, Staines in the UK, Belgium, uh, Jensen Beach, Florida, Phoenix, Arizona, Israel, St. Louis, Missouri, Salisbury in the UK, Dominican Republic, Quad Cities, uh, Iowa, I guess that is, Marquette, Michigan, Lisbon, Portugal, Maryland, Snodland, 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 UK, wow, I'm not familiar with that one, St. Cloud, Minnesota, New Brunswick, Canada, Spain, and Berlin, so welcome to all of you, it's again always remarkable. Um, how far and wide uh, we go with these Facebook Live events. It's great to have you all here. And again, it's, it's our collective curiosity that unites us. That's why we have so many people from all over the world joining us all the time. We got some questions here, Michael. Let's uh, Please. talk about this. So yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about it. Um, Dave may not have joined us at the beginning, but was the dish damaged in the hurricane? 
So maybe you can quickly summarize so, uh, to about the damage. for anybody who wasn't timing at the beginning. So the main reflector of the observatory, parts of it, relatively small number, a few hundred panels out of the nearly 40,000, were ripped off during the hurricane, or the secondary effect of when the hurricane snapped off the line feed up top and it punched down underneath the dish. Those have all been replaced. They have like, large stacks of spare panels around the edges of the dish. And they can haul those down as they need to. But they still need to go back and adjust the heights of all the panels down to the millimeter to get the surface back to work at the higher frequencies. All right. Um, what are the differences between Arecibo and the Chinese FAST radio telescope besides size? Are there other differences? So we talked a little bit about how the FAST telescope in China, this is of course much newer, has been from the beginning of the design, tried to implement automatic adjustments to the panels of the dish. That really hasn't gotten working particularly well, although I have limited information on that. Mm -hmm. They also made a design choice very early when they were designing FAST, which was that it doesn't have a large platform like this at Arecibo. Ah. Yes. Instead, it has a single small receiver pot. The advantage of this is that they can go way off to the side. Uh -huh. So with Arecibo, they try to keep the weight balance on the platform. So you've got the mirroring on one side, the line feeds on the other side. But if you're looking at something 20 degrees off to from the vertical, you're moving the Gregorian way over the here. Yeah. So now you've got not just the big amount of weight pulling down the platform, but you've got a huge amount of torque because your center of mass of the platform is way off to this side. That puts a lot of strain on the platform. It's one of the reasons why it's this huge structure. It is huge. If you wanted to go twice as far off vertical, you simply couldn't have the weight of the Gregorian receiver setup that we have mm -hmm. at Arecibo. Makes sense. So they have a much smaller receiver pod, and that then can look at much more sky, but it can't mount the same number and types of receivers that Arecibo has. So what's the frequency response uh, at fast? How, what's the range? So the right now they've been focusing on that 21 centimeter, 1420 megahertz hydrogen. So line. around one to two gigahertz kind of range. They have plans to work up to higher frequencies, trying to get to that sort of 10 gigahertz upper limit. Mm -hmm. But that will again require that they have receivers swapped in and out. Right. They and also that the dish be working at that higher precision. Right. OK. Um, Let's see, is the telescope open to the public or tours? Um, so it absolutely it is. very much is. You see, if you're looking in the le left-hand picture here, this structure at the base of one of the towers. It's a building there. You can maybe make out just, just below that vertical tower that holds up the cables. That is the visitor center. So you can, if you are visiting Puerto Rico, a lot of the cruise ship lines that work out of San Juan now work with tour buses, actually, because people on the island for a day they like to see the observatory. They'll drive you out to a parking lot in the back, and you have to hike up to the top, or there's little cars they have for that. And you can see a museum up there that talks about the history of the telescope, yep. various science that they do, and then you can walk out onto the platform and see the dish. They have started, I guess, giving basically the tour you got <laughs> to a small number of people. That yep. costs about $50 if you want the VIP tour, and you walk underneath the dish and go through the control room and see scientists doing stuff. Yeah, you can you can do that. I think you have to organize that ahead of time. It was uh, kind of like being in a zoo, actually, when I was there doing observing and talking to the scientists last December. So we're sitting there talking about some of the asteroid science that we'll discuss in a bit. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And people are walking through, taking photos. OK. I didn't think I was that entertaining, but OK. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Well, I was lucky because I was attending a a three-day conference called the Arecibo Observatory Futures Conference, where uh, scientists were meeting to discuss the future path of the observatory, the science priorities, technology developments, funding. Uh, it's primarily funded by the National Science Foundation, but also NASA funds it to do the work that Michael's most interested in and active in, uh, involving asteroids. So uh, it was really an interesting uh, workshop, and, and then, of course, getting into uh, all of, of the guts and behind-the-scenes stuff was a lot of fun. It is the most uh, visited observatory on the planet right now. And the Chinese are trying to do something similar with, with uh, the FAST telescope and make it kind of a tourist attraction. You have to be careful because it's a radio observatory. You want to keep people away with uh, you know, cell phones and anything that could cause radio frequency interference. And I think the Chinese, have, I understand, have opened up like an amusement park so nearby the, uh, the their observatory, which may not end up having been the smartest. So the situation there is kind of complicated and gets very political. So the engineers that built the FAST telescope in China, of course, wanted to understand relevant prior work. So they went to Arecibo. And they talked to a bunch of the engineers and scientists there. 
and they quickly understood that radio frequency interference is a serious problem at Arecibo. Could you visit? Please turn off your cell phone. Right. Or put it into airplane mode. <laughs> and please do not try to run a drone over the dish. Yeah, I don't think they uh, this has problem happened. that. <laughs> and it causes all sorts of interference and ruins everybody's observing. So, having understood this, the Chinese government decided that they would declare a radio quiet zone around the site of FAST, and I think they ordered an entire village of people just to leave. They did, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah that's correct. Which is not really so Can't democratic. Can't do that in Puerto Rico. There. <laughs> so, Puerto Rico, they just try to work with the local community, people have houses near the telescope, people who run cell phone towers, people who operate local TV stations to try to limit the amount of interference on particular frequencies that they care about, like that hydrogen line I mentioned. Right. And also like the, radi the radar observations I do. In that case, we want to be sure that Arecibo is not causing radio frequency interference to other people on the island, as well as also. the island not causing interference for the observatory. Yeah. Well, also, if you, if you have the Bluetooth headphones, and you visit, don't use those. Yeah, no, they don't. They, you'll see signs if you visit there. There is no microwave oven. Turn well. everything off. Yeah, no right. microwave oven, uh, no Wi Fi. Uh, did, no you, did you wish to, me to tell the story of the microwave oven? <laughs> we'll cover that maybe later. Okay. <laughs> but uh, in, in any case, uh, what's wonderful about the site is they do open it up. They get school buses of children from Puerto Rico, from all over the island, almost every day. I think they said there's over 800,000 people visit the observatory every year. And it's really interesting because, of course, there are museums where you can sort of see science on display in a museum setting. There are observatories and places where science gets done that you can't go see. So to have a place like Arecibo, which is a working research facility that is also open to the public and open to young children to come and, and visit, it's really extraordinary. It's wonderful that they have that capability. And that's why they invested a few million dollars to build this, this visitor center. So it's definitely worth the trip if you're down in Puerto Rico for some sun and beach and whatever. I, also, I highly recommend if we have anybody here who lives on the island who is not already aware of it, there's been a program at the observatory for the past several years organized by Edgar de Vera Valentin, who is from Arecibo, the city himself, called the Arecibo Observatory Space Academy, where they take high school students from schools across the island, they bring them to the observatory, and they actually do some radio astronomy working with the telescope. That's very been good. a very successful education program. Yeah. In fact, I didn't see uh, anybody on our list from Puerto Rico, so if you are watching from Puerto Rico, um, let us know and give us your name. We'll give you a shout out. Uh, let's do a few more questions because we're going to have to wrap this up and we want to talk a little bit about the science. Um, let's see. How do scans work at Arecibo? Is it complex with the Earth rotation and orbit? That's a good question. So the Earth's rotation actually is how the observatory sees different parts of the sky. It looks at stuff when it passes within 20 degrees of up, <laughs> which means you can't observe large sections of the sky. You can't observe anything that's too far north or too far south. So if you're looking at stuff that's inside the solar system, which I do, we have to wait for it to pass overhead. If you are looking at stuff, st distant stars, galaxies, clouds of gas in space, well, you can't observe anything that's too far north or too far south. Sorry. <laughs> So when the galactic plane, Milky Way, passes overhead, it's a really, really high priority observing time because that's the time of day when you can look at that section of the sky mm -hmm. and there's lots of stuff to see. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to wait till nightfall. That's if the we are advantage of radio astronomy. Observing something, then the azimuth arm will rotate around and it'll, it'll start the arm such that they're looking at that direction and then over the course of the next two and two and a half hours they'll rotate the azimuth arm around and also simultaneously adjust the elevation as the, the object moves overhead and then it goes out of range over on the other side they rotate everything back around to catch the next thing that they're looking at they actually can rotate through about two full rotations in either direction mm -hmm. so they don't always have to spend their time unwrapping the cables yeah, uh, there's a lot of time spent spinning things back around to catch the next thing before it comes overhead. Okay, uh, so great question. Let's see, um, and that was from Ria. Uh, can you talk about the ownership and governance of the Arecibo Observatory? Who decides what research is done? That's a great question. I will say that right now the, the administration and management of the Arecibo Observatory is done by the University of Central Florida. Previously it was an organization called USRA, 
uh, I think it's the United Universities Science Research Association. Yes. And, uh, but now it's the University of Central Florida, so they run it on behalf of, I think, NSF. So the telescope was initially built by, I guess, ARPA, mm -hmm. yes, ARPA right. at that point, in the 1950s for intended military applications. Then it got moved to the NSF many years ago. And then every five years, the NSF is required to recompete who gets to run the observatory for the NSF. Mm -hmm. It was previously Cornell University for quite a long That's time, right. and then USRA and the consortium of other groups, and now the consortium is led by the University of Central Florida. Right. The current management is a little complicated because the NSF is funding a large fraction of what's happening at the telescope. NASA is funding about one third of what happens at the telescope, the radar observations that I do. And then over the next few years, depending on how much money from Congress there goes to the National Science Foundation mm -hmm. and to NASA, the amount of money that the NSF is contributing to run the observatory may go down. Mm -hmm. So if you all want the continuing operations at Arecibo, you may wish to lobby Congress for that sort of thing. But the meantime, the plan is for the observatory to seek out third-party sources of funding. Right. And one of the selling points for UCSF, University of Central Florida, getting the management contract was they were very proactive in seeking out other potential sources of money. So there's potential for research organizations from other countries that right. do radio astronomy, Mexico, South America, Europe, contributing money for observing time. There is potential for the SETI Institute buying time. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. They have approached the Institute, if I recall correctly. Yes, exactly. There is a cost sheet if you wish to buy observing time for yourself for some reason. You can do that. It costs about a dollar a second. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, the interesting thing is if, if uh, an observatory is run by a scientific um, entity like NSF, you're normally applying for time on the observatory. The institute, that organization, is making decisions on, on you know, who gets the time based on the merits of the, of the proposal. But uh, if you otherwise have chunks of time, which it's going to be an increasingly large amount of time with Arecibo, that are not devoted to your primary source of funding, NSF, or to NASA, you can sell that time or you know, get other partners to, uh, to go in with you on and observing. One of the big concerns from the science community as there are these changes to the funding for the observatory, we want to really maintain some amount of what we call open skies time where anybody has some idea for some cool new science project can propose it to the observatory right. and potentially get time to do the observations. Yeah. So, so there's going to be there's an effort to try to protect that. Yeah, as much as possible. I, I think that's very important. But it, that's a wonderful question. Um, okay, is the observatory struck by lightning often? I very mean, much so. I could say so. It looks like a big metal antenna just waiting to be So struck. that is a problem because all of this is metal. The, the support towers are concrete, reinforced. So there's steel all rebar all the way up the top. But the whole support structure here is metal. It's a very good conductor. There's all sorts of ways that the lightning path can run back to the ground. Mm -hmm. So the towers get struck a lot. They've got lightning rods on them. That's fine. It goes straight to the bedrock. But if the platform gets struck, that can cause problems. So everything up there is actually pretty well insulated. But there's all these, we call the tie downs, that run from each corner of the platform right. down to the dish. They keep things in focus. As the day goes by, the temperature goes up and down, everything expands and contracts. You gotta move things up and down by a few inches. So there's basically big winches down at the bottom of those tie downs. If a lightning strike decides that the best conduction path is to run down the cables to the tie downs, it can fry them. And then everything in the telescope is out of focus for a while. <laughs> so that is a serious concern. Yeah. Yeah, so it happens. Uh, okay, great question again. How do they keep all the brush and trees from growing up and touching the instruments? Well, they don't. <laughs> Uh, I mean, they, they, they work underneath the dish constantly. Um, you'll see in some of the other photo, uh, videos and photos that I'll put up uh, later on our website, um, I, I have actually a video clip where you follow a cable up from the ground and you can see a vine climbing up the cable and in fact going through the dish and starting to spread across one of the panels. So it's a constant battle to uh, keep the, the ground underneath the dish clear. But at the same time, there's, uh, there's a, a very good reason to have all that growth underneath the dish because it provides a stable environment. It, the root structure helps absorb water and keep it from becoming just one great big mud bath. 
and, uh, and, and mudslide. So, so they go through with a weed whacker as frequently yeah, as they can. all the time, all the time. I was underneath uh, the dome and, or the dish, and they were, you know, they, they were guys all the way up the slopes working to cut back the, the brush. They, they don't want to remove it completely because it stabilizes the ground. But They've experimented with different ways of stuff that actually, if they don't get to it in time, it actually grows up through the dish. Eventually it just dries out and erodes away, but they've experimented with things. Like they had a big pair of sort of big foam snowshoes and you walk around on top of the dish. Yeah. That didn't work so well. <laughs> it's really awkward to be walking around with these huge pads to spread out your weight so you don't bend the panels. Somebody tried bringing a robot in designed to do the same thing. That didn't work that great. There was a pressure washer for a while. That also, you'd be careful if you put the, the water hose too tight, then it would bend the panels. But yeah. if you spread it out too much, then it wouldn't eat away the flop, uh, debris. So keeping the dish clean is a it's constant a problem. Constant battle. They do now use, because uh, I was asking about cleaning, you can see, I mean, even when I was there, and you'll see it again in some of the photos, um, particularly up near the edges of the dish. It's kind of there are places where there's mold and algae growing. And so they, uh, those of you with, with swimming pools out there have ever worked at a swimming pool, you know, you have these things that roam around at the bottom of the pool and kind of scrub and clean. They, so they do have these uh, kind of robotic high pressure washers that Michael was referring to that run down tracks from the perimeter of the dish and, and help them clean it. But it, it's, a, it's a constant. You have to be careful, and don't mess the dish up. Maybe. Yeah. Exactly. Also, for those who watched the James Bond movie, if I recall right, there's a scene in there where they jump onto the dish and sled down. Yes, right. <laughs> That's that not, would be like advice. running down a cheese grater. Yeah, not good. Don't do that. <laughs> no, I'm not even going to talk about the visuals there. All right, two last questions. Are there any new technologies to enhance the observatory's capabilities? Well, we, you know, new detectors can be put on all the time that help uh, extend its frequency range or add new sensitivity like the alpaca, right? So mostly at the detector, I think, is where so the new technologies are going. There's been a couple of things talked about. Bill talked a bit about the SETI engineering work to build wider frequency receivers. You can cover more of the radio spectrum at once and you don't constantly have to shift things in and out. That's useful for some things. There is discussions of what we call wider field of view. So if you're using like the camera on the iPhone here, that's covering this whole section of the sky, effectively, all at once. Here the sky is us on the wall. But <laughs> if you're using just a single antenna feed, you're just getting a single dot on the sky. It takes a really long time to map stuff. Whereas if you can make a radio feed that's effectively many, many pixels, lots of antennas mounted next to each other, then you can survey larger areas faster. But then your detector is physically a lot larger. So the uh, alpaca feed that you saw in, it's gonna be about a alpha, meter around. in the alpha feed that's in there now, those cover more than one part of the sky at once. So you can map things faster, but those are bulky detectors. So there's weight limitations to be considered. There's also some discussion of new hardware for the radar stuff that I do. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we are doing two things. We have a transmitter and a receiver mounted on the telescope. So we send out a high power radio beam from up in the dome. It bounces off the tertiary, off the secondary, off the dish, and goes off to illuminate something on the sky that we care about, typically an asteroid passing near the Earth. And this is, the, this is like the most powerful radar transmitter in the world, in yes. the world right? Yeah. It is also the single largest source of radio leakage from the Earth for people who care right. about SETI projects. <laughs> exactly. So in that case, we talk about potentially increasing the transmitter power. We talk about potentially changing the design of the transmitter a bit so that we can do higher frequency modulation. So we code the outgoing signal, and that's what gives us our resolution in space. Because again, we have a single dot on the sky, so we have to have some other way of getting information. And in that case, we just code the signal in time. The faster we can code it, the higher our resolution. Currently, we're limited to about information seven and a half meter resolution on asteroids flying by the Earth or on parts of the Moon. We have a higher resolution, but there we would need new transmitters that can handle a wider range of frequency. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And that what, would cost a couple million dollars, though, so it's a little bit of an involved project. What is the most distant asteroid? Uh, how far can can in, you go with the radar? So, so bouncing and getting that reflected image back. People who studied physics may call something called the inverse square law. If you have a signal out of space, the intensity of that signal decreases as the square of the distance as you go out. Because so you have a sphere, if you're going out as a sphere, the surface area increases the square of distance. For the radar, it's actually one over radius to the fourth, because the signal spreads out going out to the target object, 
and the echo spreads out coming back. Mm -hmm. So we're limited pretty tightly in distance. We could pick up a golf ball in orbit around the moon. Wow. There are no golf balls in orbit around the moon. Well, as far as we know. Well, Alan oh, there Shep is one. <laughs> Alan Shepard sliced, so it bounced and went back down. Oh, okay. <laughs> but we could also pick up CubeSats in orbit around the moon, which there are, mm -hmm. monitoring small satellites that have been launched off of larger lunar right. orbiters. There is then at near the asteroids passing by the Earth at maybe 10 times the distance of the moon. On those, we can get the seven and a half meter resolution. Out in the main asteroid belt now, 150, 200 million kilometers away, our resolution is down to something like 40 kilometers. So that's the belt between Mars and Jupiter. Right. Yeah. We can do observations of the moons of Jupiter mm -hmm. and even of the moons of Saturn with and Saturn's rings with Arecibo. Mm -hmm. But then a tricky thing happens. I mentioned how Arecibo can only look at things within about 20 degrees of straight up. Stuff on the sky moves across at 15 degrees an hour, roughly. So we can look at things for a bit less than three hours if they're passing straight overhead, mm -hmm. 40 degrees worth of motion. That means we can't look at anything where the distance from it to the Earth is such that it takes light more than an hour and a half to travel that distance. Mm -hmm. Because by the time our signal goes out and time it comes back down, well, it'll be way over here on the sky, and right. the telescope's looking totally the wrong direction. <laughs> So we can't look at anything past the distance of Saturn. Okay. In we've terms got, of radar. We've got radar observations of the rings of Saturn, of Titan, mm -hmm. of things down to the size of Enceladus. Mm -hmm. So that's 300 miles, 500 kilometers wide, the moon of Saturn. Still with the geysers coming out. Right. We can't see the geysers, but we can measure that the surface of the moon is very, very clean ice. Mm -hmm. We can't look at anything further away. Yeah. yeah. With the radar observations. Yeah. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up because it's uh, it's already been a, an hour, but this has been a lot of fun. Can you talk briefly about what's in front of you? And, okay, uh, so I had some slides for this. You want to? May not have time for those. Well, just pull them up real quick, see if you can. Oh, so where are they, Lee? Should be on the desktop. Ah, there it is. Okay. So this is a copy of a talk I gave last week. So where is it? Should come up. Yeah. There it is. Okay. So we have again the Arecibo telescope. Yay. And then we have another radio telescope here in California, a place called Goldstone, that we can do some similar stuff with, but it's nowhere near as sensitive. So we have the asteroid out in space. We send the radio beam out to the object, it bounces off, it comes back to the ground. We can get a lot of things very quickly this way. One, we get where it is in space very precisely. We get the line of sight velocity from the Doppler shift of the signal, again, very precisely. This is useful for things like, is this asteroid going to hit the Earth in 800 years? Yeah, it's important to know. There is an object called Bennu. We observed it. There's a couple of possible Earth impacts between the years 2175 and 2200. We can't rule it out yet. So now there's a spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx that is in orbit around Bennu that's trying to get more data to rule that out, <laughs> okay. among other things. We have observed several hundred asteroids this way. So the idea is to survey not just the orbits, but also the sizes and shapes of different objects. So we measured the distance to the ob uh, object, now down to a meter or two with the time of flight of the radio beam. And then we can make pictures with resolution down to the s less than 10 meters. So we have here an object called 1982 UY4, it's basically a lumpy ball, but it's, we can say it's two kilometers wide and it's got boulders scattered all over its surface. And then we've got other asteroids that look like two pieces sitting on each other. So how do we explain that history? And then in some cases, we have asteroids that have satellites around them, so they have their own tiny moons. And we can see those with Arecibo better than we can with any other telescope. It may not show up depending on how good the camera is here, but there's a small dot there and a small dot there. It's two small moons spinning around this larger asteroid. On the right end. And that whole thing was passing by a few million kilometers away from the Earth when we got these pictures. Fantastic. So we provide lots of detailed information on this population of objects passing near the Earth. That is the science goal. And because Congress is pleased to tell NASA to track and characterize as many near-Earth asteroids as possible, we have several hundred hours of observing time at Arecibo every year dedicated to this project. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. And much respect goes to Ann Verke and Adriana Valentin and Patrick Taylor and the rest of the people who actually do the observing down at Arecibo. I just get to sit here most of the time <laughs> and watch that happening on my computer. Data. And uh, if those of you who followed our talks and know about that Frontier Development Lab program we have, or FDL, a couple of years in a row, we've had programs where we've been doing so-called shape modeling, where we've taken the radar signature of the 
uh, observed uh, asteroid. That's the process of going from these radar images to, to three-dimensional model like models like that on the computer, which we can then print out just for fun. So we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to derive the actual physical shape and characteristics of that asteroid based on the radar signature that we pick up. Current ways to do that are really time consuming. I would very much like to have faster ways to do things, even approximately. Yeah. So. Well, when we started that project. Um, the Frontier Development Lab here, yeah. and then now down at Arecibo itself, Sean Marshall is a postdoc working down there. He was here for the FDL lab two years ago, is trying to get that working you know, real data in real time. And they're almost, according to Sean, they're getting close to almost real time. <laughs> which Processing is, is fast. Yeah. Getting data ready to be processed, that still is a work in progress. Yeah. But it, uh, prior to these FDL workshops uh, and the application of of AI and machine learning. It could be as many as like three months of work for a, just to, for an astronomer to master. This one took two years, but that was back in the go. 1990s. Things are a little bit faster now. We'd like them to be faster still. Yeah, all right. Well, listen, uh, we hope you've enjoyed this long tour of the Arecibo Observatory, but uh, well, there'll be more stuff on our website with images and video clips about the observatory. It's pretty fascinating place to see and uh, very much related to the science we do here at the Institute, particularly the work that Michael does on asteroids. Um, of course, the uh, not in a radar transmitting mode, but just in a passive listening mode, that observatory is looking at things, uh, including phenomena in distant galaxies. So a lot of science is done on the observatory. Um, and we'll be putting out a link to the Arecibo uh, website so you can learn more about the work that they do. And as we talked about, if you get down to Puerto Rico and you'd like to go see it, Please do, they'd love to see you. They get lots of visitors and, and it's really a remarkable facility to see. So with that, we're gonna say goodbye from Mountain View and the SETI Institute. Um, for those of you local in the California Bay Area, we have a wonderful talk coming up next week at SRI for our so-called SETI talk series, which is going to be about the um, New Horizons flyby of MU69 or what's also been called the uh, Ultima Thule object at the very edges of our solar system. And uh, the principal investigator on that mission, Alan Stern, will be joined by the head of the hazard avoidance team, who is actually with the SETI Institute, our own Mark Showalter. And Molly Bentley, who hosts the, the uh, Big Picture Science radio program, will be here as well. So that's going to be a great uh, evening. We will, of course, also be uh, filming that and putting it out on our Facebook page. So if you're not local, you can still see it. So lots of more uh, science and outreach from the Institute to come. And in the meantime, Michael, thanks again for joining Thank me. You. Thanks, team, for helping us collect the uh, information and questions. And for all of you around the planet, we'll see you next week from Mountain View, California, at the SETI Institute. Take care, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>